Now that the 2023 season has come to an end, let's talk about my 10 things to watch for in 2024. Let's go. It's the number one college football show. What's up, folks? Welcome to the number one college football show. I am your host, RJ Young. Thank you for watching on the Fox Sports app, YouTube, or listening wherever you get your podcast. Today on the show, we got to talk about 10 things I'm watching for, 10 things to look forward to in 2024. Some of these are a little bit more in the weeds, but I think most of you will be on board with the topics that we have on hand, ranging from the expansion of the college football playoff to what can you expect from coach prime in year two at Colorado. So let's get started at number 10 and work our way to number one, starting at number 10 old rivalries renewed. This one's for you, Texas and Texas a and M a and M can no longer dodge the longhorns. And I never thought that I would be the guy picking the longhorns in a fight, but I am because a and M didn't want the smoke. And the sec said, Hey, not only are we going to let Texas in, Y'all are going to play them in year one, and we're going to get that rivalry back to going around Thanksgiving, which, you know, was part of my childhood, full stop. You know, like, it's one of those rivalries that you look forward to because I think in the South, we're talking about Texas and Texas A&M being like Ohio State and Michigan. They do not like each other. They do not hide it. And you are playing for way more than winning football games. One of my favorite rivalries, and frankly— I'm so glad to see it is back. Now, rivalries that did not make the cut. Michigan versus everybody. Shout out Bill Lambeer, who ain't made a dime in NIL money. Now that y'all show, y'all stole Detroit versus everybody. Uh, next on the list there, Oklahoma fans versus Lincoln Riley. If you know, you know. If you don't, I invite you to just look at Twitter or your favorite USC or Oklahoma message board if you catch my drip. And then finally... The College Football Playoff Selection Committee versus FSU Twitter. Now, this is a new one, but I feel like it's going to go on for quite some time as we have ended the era of 14 playoffs. And Florida State went 12-0, won an ACC title, and was told to kick rocks for its trouble. Yo, I'm looking forward to 2024. If for no other reason than all four of these rivalries are going to be live and popping for the foreseeable future. Number nine on the list. Nebraska, that's what I wrote down. But what this is really about is, is Dylan Rayola going to be the Lisan al Gaib? Is that the Muad'Dib? Or are we talking about Nebraska having to stick his hand in the box and scream once more? Okay? Now, I say this because Dylan Rayola coming to Nebraska was a tremendously big deal for Nebraska fans. Never mind that dude had committed to Ohio State and Georgia before committing to Nebraska a couple days before the early signing period began. We all know he's a five-star caliber player. He's got all the tools necessary to be an elite passer. And frankly, he could be that guy to lead them into this new era of Big Ten and college football playoff football that they have been looking for. I looked this up because Nebraska and throwing the football ain't exactly synonymous. You know what I mean, if anything, we're talking about Nebraska and running the football. So if I ask you, as I ask our producers on the show, who is the first 3,000 yard passer in Nebraska school history? I think you would either have to be from Norman, Oklahoma, or have been a very close watcher of Nebraska football for the past 20 years because that man's name is Zach Taylor, 2006 Big 12 Offensive Player of the Year, Zach Taylor, Norman to own Zach Taylor. I'm saying this to say if Dylan Rayola can be the kind of guy that throws for 4,000 yards and rushes 500. We're talking about him taking over the record books in the passing categories in year one of the Nebraska experience, and they would like nothing more than that. This is going to be an interesting year for Nebraska as they had an opportunity to get bowl eligible for the first time since 2016 and 2023. They lost three in a row. They didn't make the cut for bowl games. And I'm thinking, man, we got five and seven Minnesota in there, but not Nebraska. That's, That's tough. That's tough. But Getting Dylan Rayola on board, right, and having Matt Rule in year two, I think we could expect to see Nebraska start to win football games and maybe get to bowl eligibility for the first time in eight years. I'd be here for it. I believe that college football is better when Nebraska is good. Nebraska, 
Come on, get better, baby. Number eight on the list, I wrote down USC. And I've already talked about Lincoln Riley versus Oklahoma fans, but you get what I'm saying here. Looking forward to finding out how Lincoln Riley responds to the worst season he has had in his career as a head coach. Seven and five, needing to win the Holiday Bowl to get to seven wins. Now, the Holiday Bowl figures into this discussion because in a season where this seemed to be like two bowl games that absolutely matter, and we got 41 bowl games, the Holiday Bowl mattered for SC because they're playing a Louisville team that was really good, that made the ACC title game, and they were playing without Caleb Williams, and they were playing without Malachi Nelson. So Miller Moss was the guy by default. And I remember Miller Moss as the guy who was still on the sideline in 2022 as Caleb Williams was out there against Utah on one leg going, that's how little faith you got in that guy. Turns out he's developed since then, or maybe it was just that Caleb Williams is that much better on one leg than Miller Moss. But I'm not so sure that that's true anymore as Miller had a really great time against Louisville. See what I did there? Now, he threw six TDs in that game, and Lincoln Riley said in the post-game press conference he probably scared off anybody that ever wanted to come here. And if you were following the rumors and the news as it was coming, Will Howard might have been at USC, and then Miller Moss threw for six TDs. And now Will Howard is at Ohio State, right? Now, I don't think that Lincoln Riley is done in the portal by a long shot, but I think Moss's really great outing against a really great team in a bowl game that... Well, us old folks like the Holiday Bowl used to absolutely mean something, means quite a bit to him. Now, the next thing to ask here is, can Danton Lynn do what neither Mike Stoops nor Alex Grinch could do with Lincoln Riley? And that is put together the kind of defense that is capable of leading you to the college football playoff and not getting you spanked. Okay? Now, he went to UCLA to go get the rising star. That's the defensive coordinator. And he's installed him. What I'm curious about is how that's going to marry with the scheme that Riley is going to employ in 2024, because it felt to me like we finally reached this moment where Lincoln Riley's offense is not defensively friendly, right? If you want to be predicated on taking the ball away from people and tackles for loss so you can get it back to the offense, one of the things that you actually want from the offense is a breather. And Riley's offense isn't interested in breathers. They're going for six on every single play whenever they can. Now, are you going to change your play calling up just a little bit, given what Michigan was able to do this year, given what Alabama was able to do this year? Maybe that remains to be seen. And the last thing that I really want to know about USC in 2024, can USC, Hector, and uh, and and them, right, the, the folks from Troy, go up there to the Kings in the North, the Ann Arbor Achaeans, and throw down? Because USC got to go to Ann Arbor in September this season. And while we have no idea what either one of those rosters are actually going to be like, these are two brands that we're all very excited about. This is a traditional Rose Bowl matchup that now we're going to get to see on the regular because they're in the same conference, baby. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on, but this is a pivotal year, not just because SC is joining the Big Ten, but because we're going to get to find out what kind of backbone Lincoln Riley has after a season where he ain't win no 10 games, okay? I'm also going to get to find out just how badly USC fans want to keep Leak and Riley around if they don't get to a 10-win season in their first year in the Big Ten. A lot riding on this season for the Trojans. Number seven on the list, Oklahoma, but particularly quarterback. I got a prediction here. The first prediction I'm going to throw down in this uh, in this particular episode, but Jackson Arnold becomes Oklahoma's first 4,000-yard passer since Kyler Murray. Now, you've seen him enough to know that dude has all the talent in the world. He can make every throw, and he's got a cannon. Now, can you develop him into the kind of dude that can be a little bit more careful with the ball and get the ball out of his hands in a shorter amount of time, right? So I'm thinking if Kyler Murray could go for 4,000 and 1,000, that Jackson Arnold could at very least go for 4,500. Now, Kyler Murray is a special kind of player, right? And 4,000, 1,000 guys, just they don't come out of nowhere. But if anybody has the talent on campus to do it since then, it is that guy. I'm also interested to see what Brent Venables does defensively right now, right? as we're taping this on a Tuesday for Thursday, right? You're seeing this on Thursday. 
I know we are interested in finding out whether or not Zach Alley is going to be the defensive coordinator at Oklahoma. And if he is, it's going to be a dude that Brent Venables helped raise, right? Like legitimately. That dude showed up at 17 years old and wanted to be a head coach, wanted to get into coaching, didn't try to try out for the team, went straight to being a student assistant for Dabo Sweeney, and basically was tied to the hip with Brent Venables since 2011. I would like to see what this looks like on a football field because the defense just let Oklahoma down, particularly against Arizona. And a little bit later on, when we're talking about Oklahoma State and Kansas and, and just what the foibles, or I should say the weaknesses of this defense were. I want to see Jackson Arnold have a defense that can carry him from time to time because he's going to go into a an SEC that's loaded, but also I think the most difficult schedule on earth in 2024. Moving on to number six, the most intriguing non-conference games that we have on the schedule. I'm going to list these and then give a prediction at the end. Texas at Michigan, obviously, we're all interested in that one because, well, these folks from the South got to go up there to the North and get this win off of Lake Michigan. I can't wait to see how the reigning national champions welcome in the Texas Longhorns after making a college football playoff for the first time in school history. LSU versus USC is in Vegas. Baton Rouge going to show up in Vegas. Now, LA types, y'all know how to do this, right? But I can't wait to see my people show up there looking for the $2 craps. I can't wait to see what we do to them penny slots. But it's going to be so much fun to watch those two teams go at it. Brian Kelly versus Lincoln Riley. All of the trappings. Then we got Clemson versus Georgia at, in Atlanta. That one's going to be, I think, pretty good. We know that Georgia is a juggernaut. I made them number two in my way too early top 25. But what can Clemson be by the time they get to this game? And I think that Clemson fans feel a little bit froggy about this when they feel like after what they have been through the last couple of years, particularly this year, that they are probably trending in the right direction to perhaps upset the mighty Georgia Bulldogs. Alabama at Wisconsin, not unlike seeing Texas go to Michigan. I can't wait for folks from Tuscaloosa to get all the way up there to Madison and again, find out, please, please let it be chilly. Please, please, please let it be chilly. Like, Nick Saban going to be fine. Coach Michigan State. It's the rest of us that I would be worried about because my people, we do hot weather. But this cold that we got going on right now, we don't do this. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. And in Madison, y'all, they'd be out there in the, in, in the overalls with, like, no shirt on, in the snow and the ice. I know that they wanted to be cold, but I'm looking forward to it as well. Notre Dame at Texas A&M is also going to be fun because, well, I don't know who I'm going to pick in that particular game. I guess I'm going to ride with Marcus Freeman on this one, but I think the more intriguing storyline there is obviously Mike Elko, who's coached at Notre Dame and is back at AM and what that game might be or might not be going into this 2024 season. Also got Colin Klein as an offensive coordinator in that one and Mike Denbrock as an offensive coordinator in that one. I hope it's entertaining, but I'm just not going to hold my breath because, well, AM is AM. And Notre Dame will mess around and win 9, 10 games and then drop this one. So I, I just don't know. But I am looking forward to it. My prediction here is the Big Ten wins all of these games that they play. That means Wisconsin, Alabama, Michigan, Texas, USC, LSU. Right? If I'm wrong about it, we can talk about it. But I like the Big Ten this year. I like what it was showing as members of the Pac-12 and Big Ten in 2023. And I expect that conference to really start to show itself and perhaps take over this mantle from the SEC as the best conference in all of football. We will follow this one very closely, especially as we get to the college football playoff. Next on the list, let's go to number five, new SEC matchups. I, this is just going to be a reoccurring topic on the show because I am, I am who I am and I believe what I believe, right? So Texas, Tennessee, excuse me, at, at Oklahoma, Alabama at Oklahoma, Oklahoma at LSU, Oklahoma at Ole Miss, Oklahoma at Missouri, Georgia at Texas. So my prediction in all of this, Texas and OU are going to combine to go 6-0, and which would mean that Oklahoma just put Texas on its back, which, you know, is just what Oklahoma has been doing for the University of Texas for the past decade. So this won't be that much different. If you win your game against Georgia, you did your one job, Texas. You did your one job. But don't let Oklahoma go mess around and go 5-0 and with what I just told you, Tennessee, Alabama, LSU, Ole Miss, Missouri, because I will never let you forget it. I, I, I will not. I will not. 
Not with that cupcake SEC schedule that you got. And they threw us, but how now in the what for in year one? Good grief, give me to Christmas. I'm get, I'm still upset about this one. I'm still upset about this. We're going to talk about me being upset about this one for the foreseeable future. Number four on the list, new Big Ten matchups. Now, this one got a little bit more variety. Okay. USC at Michigan. Okay, we already got there. Michigan at Washington. A rematch of the national title game? Sign me up. And that's in October, right? Right when we get to find out who's good and who's not, we get the national title game rematch. I'm really excited about that one. Ohio State at Oregon. Ohio State and Oregon. All right, let me drop, let me back up here because there's a little bit of history on this one. So my first year at Fox, when I started doing top 25 rankings, one of the things that I wanted to do was make sure that if you won a football game, you got credit for winning that football game. If you lost that football game, that yeah, you had to eat that. So the thing about Ohio State and Oregon is Oregon showed up without Kayvon Thibodeau, and beat Ohio State at the shoe. Duck fans were feeling themselves. Matter of fact, a couple of little boys put the rubber ducky on the O block, right? And we even did a segment about it over here on the show. And then I proceeded to rank Ohio State like a team that lost to Oregon at home. And not unlike Michigan fans in 2022, Ohio State fans in 2021 would never let me forget this one. To which I'm going, hey, look, Beat Oregon in Eugene, right? Then then we can just keep coming on with the calm. But that that Oregon team, man, like Dan Lanning has been on it since he got in Eugene. It's not just that he's been able to go get into the transfer portal, get players, but he's been able to turn those players into outstanding players, right? So going into this season, we're going to miss Bo Nix, but you got Dylan Gabriel and Dante Moore now. You got Jordan James. You got Tez Johnson, right? And Ohio State still doesn't know who its starting quarterback is going to be. I think the Dan Lanny's got to feel great about this one. Autzen is a rocking place. And if Ohio State shows up there like I think they will, and we finally get this game that we thought we were going to get in 2020, I think this could be one of the games of the year. I genuinely do. I think if the defense that Jim Knowles can implant, uh, implement is going to be as good as the one he had in 2023, you get the quarterback situation sorted run the football, find a couple of playmakers on the outside, this could end up being another classic, not unlike Oregon versus Washington the first time, week seven in 2023. Next on the list, Penn State at USC. Again, a Rose Bowl matchup. That's one of the things I love so much about the new Big Ten. It used to be things had to drop right for us to get a Penn State at USC or in, or in LA, right? Now, rather than going to the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, just go show up to Coliseum. So we get James Franklin versus Lincoln Riley, and we get Andy Kotelnicki versus Danton Lynn, right? And we get Tom Allen versus Lincoln Riley. I'm really excited about this one. I, I am genuinely excited because Penn State is reaching Texas territory where they are doing the least with the most. Every time I talk to Penn State fans, they always believe that they should be better than they are. You won 10 games in 2023. Yes, RJ, but we have not beat Ohio State and Michigan in the same year since 2016, Micah Parsons was a sophomore that year. And by the by the way, that was a long time ago. We're talking about Micah Parsons being the first player since Reggie White to have 13 sacks in three consecutive seasons to enter the league. Spend that time. I don't know that beating USC is going to get you any closer to beating Ohio State and Michigan, but you get my point. I think that's going to have a lot to say about who gets to play in that Big Ten Conference Championship. And Penn State doesn't have to play in a Big Ten East anymore. So you got that going for you. You just... You got to go through USC and Ohio State and Michigan. You, you know what it is. You know what it is. And Penn State fans already just turned this off. USC versus Wisconsin. I'm going to be excited about that one again. Madison, I we covered it. But SC is really going to get the real Big Ten experience, I guess is the point to make here. The prediction that I have in this one is the Big Ten produces its first Heisman winner since 2007. That is a topic that I find fascinating. Because Marvin Harrison Jr. just became the first Bolitnikoff Award winner at Ohio State since 1995. And it had me thinking, okay, as Michigan just won the college football playoff national championship and didn't really have a Heisman finalist, feels like now that we got Lincoln Riley coaching in that conference along with Ryan Day, along with Dan Lanning, along with Kalen DeBoer, to go along with perhaps Jim Harbaugh, you know, we're going to just go ahead and say Jim Harbaugh still head coach of Michigan. 
I think we got the real prospect of having a Heisman winner come out of that conference because it is just that deep. And perhaps in this reign of terror by SEC schools for which Oklahoma is one. So I'm just going to count them in all of this. But I think we're going to see some great individual play. And if we see some great individual play, we'll have a Heisman winner. Unlike a Heisman finalist like Marvin Harrison Jr., who's playing a dependent position, we'll probably get into the quarterbacks being the guys that get lifted up for that award come December 2024. Then number three on our list of things that I am most looking forward to in 2024. This is the first year of the expanded college football playoff. Now, presently, it is a six plus six model. Six automatic bids for conference champions and then six at-large bids. We expect that to change. We expect that to go to five plus seven or five conference championship, uh, conference champion automatic bids and then seven at-larges because when they first did this, the Pac-12 was still very much the conference of champions. Now the Pac-12 is defunct. I never thought that I would see that day. Like, I'm being really sincere when I say this, but I don't think that you are going to lift up, say, the American or the Mountain West for that spot. I also think that this is going to give the selection committee and us, quite frankly, a lot more leeway in who we want to be in the college football playoff so you ain't got to call the feds. Because FSU fans don't know how to act. I'm not going to condone that. That's 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 offsides. That that that's 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 offsides. Stop doing that. But I think that we can give ourselves as much room to make sure that we get the best 12 teams in that we also want to see play football. This is going to go a long way toward that, right? It also makes room for things like Liberty to get stomped out by Oregon, just not in the Fiesta Bowl, right? We'd also get into a conference champion who is undefeated, coming out of all of those group of five conferences being considered right now. We also know the score. We know that the stronger conferences should get automatic bids, but also what are going to be the unintended consequences of this move, right? Like I think on paper, like everybody else, this is a good idea. I've always wanted a for real playoff in college football. I don't subscribe to what the old people say when they're talking about, it used to be that, you could just argue about who the national champion was. It used to be that we didn't care who the national champion was. We we made it regional. Now nah, to hell with that. I've been watching television, college football, since I was a child. College football has been on TV, both on cable and on broadcast. Long are the uh, day, long gone are the days when, oh yeah, you'd read about perhaps Michigan playing for the opportunity to claim a national championship in the Rose Bowl or even the Holiday Bowl, right? People saying we let BYU claim that championship in 1984 because they won the Holiday Bowl. I'm going, no, nah, man, I love what the NFL does. I love what high school football does. I love what literally every other major sport does. Have a for real playoff system. Now, because we are in year 156, when we are about to implement this change, I think we're going to see some unintended consequences of the likes of which some might be cool, some might not. Might be cool to have not just the blue bloods in it, but if you finish third in the Big Ten, you still got a shot to get into this thing. If you finish fourth in the SEC, you still got a shot to get in this thing, right? If you made the Big 12 title game, you still got a shot to get in this thing, right? And you'll give us more games that matter while also limiting the number of bowls that are just on television to be on television because I could go into this, but ESPN basically engineered all of these bowls later and we gave us more things to watch. And now it's just cluttered because we got the early signing period. We got the transfer portal. And the NFL has expanded to 17 games, right? We, we cannot act like the ground beneath us has not shifted. Now, another unintended consequence of this is could end up with an 8-14 in a 12-team playoff. And we could end up seeing what has sometimes happened in the NFL where you just decide to rest your starters because you know that you're going to play in the conference championship. The way I look at this is, Georgia plays Georgia Tech. Many people think that Georgia Tech's second team should be able to beat Georgia Tech most years. However, if you are undefeated and you have an opportunity to run the table, do you care to if you're the Georgia Bulldogs or are you just going to try to save what you got, keep your powder dry, and take it in the conference championship where you're absolutely going to have to play your best ball to win that automatic qualifier to the college football playoff? 
which leads me to my prediction on this. I don't think we're going to see a team go undefeated in 2024. One is what I just laid out for you, right? If we get into a position where people can rest their best players, they will, especially given what injuries can occur and do occur to some of the stars in this sport. But also because we're, we got so many new teams playing each other, right? You're going to have to pull film on teams that you've never played before. And you're going to have to go back to TV copy. I think we're going to find out that there's a lot more variance, but also that it's going to mean the season is a lot more unpredictable. And because of that unpredictability, and we're going to have more teams playing more meaningful games in a 12-team playoff, I just think the likelihood of seeing a 15-0, 16-0 conference, uh, conference national champion is just not great. I think it would not shock me that Michigan is the last undefeated national champion we see for quite some time. And you know what? I'm fine with that. I love that we demand perfection, but I love that we demand perfection because we don't have that many opportunities to play for championships, right? If you expand the playoff or extend, depending on what kind of grammatical Nazi you want to be, I don't, and I'm an English professor, then you're fine with this, right? I think that this is going to be good for the sport. I think this is going to keep the sport intact and also help to nationalize it in a meaningful way. All right, number two on the list is the game, that is Michigan, is at Ohio State this season, 2024. This follows not just a third straight loss for Ohio State to Michigan, not just a third straight year where that loss has led to you not playing in the Big Ten Championship. It's getting to where we're counting things against Ryan Day, and I don't like it. So Ryan Day has lost eight games, right? One of those is Cotton Bowl to Missouri, okay? Three of those are in Michigan. It's also that Ohio State has not won the Big Ten title since 2019, Right. Think about that for just a second. Justin Fields was that quarterback the last time that they are me, 2020. Right. The last time that they won a Big Ten title 2020 and then basically had a, a chance to play for the national championship. Right. Now we're getting into this thing where Michigan is going to show up like Ohio State did in 2015 and say, hey, how how's it feel to know that you're playing the reigning national champions? In a, in a rivalry where you hate everybody, right? Like, that, that's one of the things I respect so much about the game is it absolutely matters. And there are people that not just pick sides, but i tell you a story. I have had work done on my home basically since the season ended because that's the time when I can do this. And I was putting out some bids or asking for bids on some projects around the house. I kid you not, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I had a fella tell me, that he was ready to bid until he learned what I do and what the show is about. And he said, I'm an Ohio State fan, and I remember you thought that we weren't good in 2021 because we lost to Oregon. Dog. D -d Dog. What? That's how they feel about this in Ohio State, Michigan. And now you got Michigan folks talking about Michigan men everywhere they go, talking about who is a Michigan man and who is not. And they get to hold their he uh, heads up high, but their nose is going to be a little bit higher in the air. And Ohio State is just going to have to eat this all year long. Because it's one thing to lose the game. It's another thing to lose the game in a year in which Michigan goes undefeated, wins the national championship. I don't know that you're going to be able to live with that for, for very long if you are Ryan Day, because they will just get tired of it. Even though you have this remarkable record of 56-8 and eight since you decided to be the head coach at the Ohio State University. My prediction, though, I think that the winner of the game will be a national semifinalist. One, it's been true, basically going back to 2019, right? And even 2020, when they didn't play the game, Ohio State still found a way to get there. We're also talking about the uh, in a four-team playoff, we still thought that Ohio State was one of the four best teams in the sport after a loss to Michigan. Like, Michigan and Ohio State are two teams that have not just a national brand, but they have everybody's respect, right? People believe that they are good unless you somehow root for Alabama and you lost to Texas by 10 points at home. Then maybe you're going to go, I don't know if they're that good, right? I would have been interested to find out if we put in an Ohio State that lost to Michigan, provided it went that way, right? If we were in this matchup or an Alabama that lost to Texas. Like I, I would be interested because then... Perhaps we could get Michigan-Ohio State in the national semifinal anyway. But I think that that game is going to just 
get larger in significance, not smaller because of the playoff, right? We're going to see national titles come out of the Big Ten, national titles come out of the SEC, and oddly the ACC Big 12 from time to time, but Ohio State and Michigan are always going to figure into what we think are the best teams in college football. Okay, number one on the list, thing I'm most looking forward to in 2024, Coach Prime's 2024 season, his year two at Colorado. Not unlike Lincoln Riley, Prime is coming off the worst season that he's ever had as a football coach. I'm willing to bet that even as a youth football coach, he didn't go four and eight. Okay. He also has seen both of his coordinators leave. One in Charles Kelly went back home to Auburn, right? The other in Sean Lewis became head coach of San Diego State. He also has jettisoned the offensive line, and he's trying to rebuild that from scratch. All while we're all watching him, and he knows that, and he's banking on it, okay? I think living up to the hype that was at Jackson State and, frankly, what they showed through the first quarter of the season, third of the season, at Colorado, we want to see them build on that. Now it's going to be tough as they are going to embark on a new journey as well. They're going into the Big 12. And their schedule features number 23, Kansas. By the way, Kansas' highest final AP role, AP poll ranking since 2007. Lance Leipold, man. That dude's amazing at what he does. Number 18, Kansas State. Number 16, Oklahoma State. Number 11, Arizona. Surprise, surprise. And FCS Power North Dakota State and Utah. Now, five of these games are Big 12, uh, Big 12 competition, right? You, you can't avoid these, right? Teams are just going to be good. But I don't know who puts North Dakota State on their schedule. I, I, don't, I don't see the win there. I don't, I don't see the win there. If you beat North Dakota State, cool. You beat an FCS team. You're an FBS team in a Power 4 school. Okay? If you lose to North Dakota State, nobody's going to say, hey, you lost to one of the most dominant programs on earth dating back to 2010. You lost to an FCS program. There's just no wins here. You know what I'm saying? Like it's why, like watching South Dakota State play Iowa last year. There are no wins there. I would not schedule that game, and I will be very interested to see if that August 31 North Dakota State game stays on the schedule in 2024. Now Prime has gone on record. He says, hey, wherever you put on the schedule, that's who I want. Well, January 9th, 2024, North Dakota State's on the schedule. Colorado going to get the Bison and Colorado State and Nebraska, and then you go into Big 12 competition. It's going to test them. It's really going to test them. So I'm looking forward to not just Shador in this year or Travis Hunter in this year. I would like to see an offensive line that could protect Shador from a stiff breeze if they were huddled in a storm shelter because they couldn't last year. Okay. I would also like to see a really cool defensive coordinator. Now, perhaps I'm getting a little too far into the weeds on this one, but Pat Shermer was calling the plays for Colorado at the end of the 2023 season. Perhaps he'll call the plays in 2024. We'll see. But at defense coordinator, I thought we all thought that Charles Kelly was going to stick around. He did not. So you got a vacancy that still hasn't been filled just yet. So I came up with five defensive coordinator candidates that I would like to see at Colorado, okay? Number one, Mike Zimmer, right? Who's been a part of the prime experience going back to Jackson State. Mike Zimmer's a great defensive mind and frankly was a pretty doggone good head coach the Minnesota Vikings. Next on the list, Leslie Frazier, who helped turn the Buffalo Bill defense into one that was dominant and great until he took a leave, right? Al Harris, secondary coach, Dallas Cowboys. Now, A, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. Yes, yes I am. Number two, that dude has turned them dudes into some guys. Like, there's no Trayvon Diggs, and we got Ron Bland out there doing stuff. Al Harris out there just whispering what you need to be heard, and Dallas' secondary does not suck. Now, we also got Mike Parsons rushing the passer, but you get my point here. I would like to see what Al Harris could do as a defensive coordinator. Perhaps he's in a great spot, though, right? Because he got them dudes charged up, and the Dallas Cowboys are going to make a run at the Super Bowl this playoff season. I have spoken it into existence. I'm telling you, it's Leroy Thompson over here. The Super Bowl cometh to me now. 
ain't been about no winning no Super Bowl since I was nine years old. Dak, I know you didn't want to wear the NFC East hat, but I need you to act like that. Okay. Next one on the list for uh, next one on the list for me, excuse me. Charlie Strong. I think Charlie Strong is a pretty outstanding defensive mind. He was doing great work in Florida. And then finally, Ed Reed. I think, I think, I think I would love to see Ed Reed, Ed Reed boy at Colorado. Now, dude tried to take over Bethune Cookman. Turns out they got feelings down there too. So that didn't last very long. But I know for a fact that Deion Sanders was recruiting Ed Reed to be the head coach at Jackson State upon his departure. Now, I don't know if Ed Reed is interested in such a job because such a job is demanding and, frankly, it ain't always fun. But to hear people talk about Ed Reed's football IQ, his intellect, his ability to know what the quarterback is doing and how, I'm always going to be interested in that guy being able to put together a defense. I think that having a guy like Ed Reed, another defensive back, the greatest safety who ever lived, with prime, two dudes that are charismatic and could recruit their behinds off, is intoxicating to me, right? And like last year, they will be must-see television. So those are my top five for the uh, Colorado defense coordinator position. We'll see if prime takes me up on any one of those. And we will be back uh, live next Tuesday, new schedule. So live Tuesday, 6 Central, 7 Eastern, and then we will be back on demand that Thursday for the foreseeable future. If you are a longtime watcher of this YouTube channel, you understand that I used to post a video every single day at 6 p.m. So that time has always been one that we feel very cool about, and I'm grateful to do these live shows during the off season for you. So please show up. Let me know what you want to talk about. Let me know what you're interested in. We'll continue to follow the news as it happens. Jim Harbaugh, notwithstanding, we will we'll see you again next Tuesday live right here. All right. Our number one college football show leads of screening are Jack Coakley and Torn Westfall. They make us better in the film room. Production assistant Kiara Santana puts a special in our special teams. Social producer JV Duncan makes sure the recruits and the rivals see the cake we bake. Dave Sable is sending in the signal. Senior producer Catherine Cordy sees the entire field from the booth. Lead producer Tyler Wojak calls the plays from the sideline and the play snaps on my clap. We'll see y'all live next Tuesday. Until then, stay low, keep those feet driving. Doses. <laughs>